not letting our bands be our cooling board for our colors, our swallowed chicks. There was a many that laid down last night that did not get up this morning. But Lord, you saw fit to wake us. Oh Lord, and we woke. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the longevity. We thank you for healing in the family. Healing in this Loveland family. We thank you for each individual and we ask you, Heavenly Father, to answer the prayers of the people, Heavenly Father. We know that through faith, it's done. Yes, yes. Lord, we thank you. Thank we you. ask you, Heavenly Father, to move through the Holy Spirit on those, the homeless, Heavenly Father. We pray for the bereaved this morning, Heavenly Father. You said man goes to his long home and the mourners go about the street. We pray for the mourners right now, Heavenly Father. We pray for all of those mothers that had sick sons, Heavenly Father. We know that they will be healed. In the name of Jesus, right now we demand that they be healed. In Jesus' name. We pray for the pastor as he comes to deliver this word, Heavenly Father. Let this word pierce our minds and our hearts and our bodies so that we can apply it, Heavenly Father. Oh Lord, we know that you're a wonderful, mighty, loving, kind God. A God of mercy and grace. And thank you, Lord. Thank and Lord, we just want to thank, thank you this morning. Thank you, thank you for our families. Yes. Thank you for our finances. Yes. Thank you, Heavenly thank Father, for good health and strength, yes. sound minds and sound bodies, Heavenly Father. Yes. And if there be anyone that has need of, of healing in their bodies, Heavenly Father, we know that we can call on the mighty name, Jehovah Rapha, and you will heal us, Lord. We just want to thank you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to let the mighty spirit of the Holy Spirit move on this place. Oh, yeah. Come yeah. now, Holy Spirit. Come now, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. 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 And amen. Well, family, I just want to say to you briefly that fear and faith are the same. They both take faith which one are you going to believe <laughs> Amen. I we count it victory, victory. Amen. Amen. we count it victory yes, sir. victory because it's already done yes sir <clears throat> many of you heard this song a number of times and it says I can't stop now I can't stop now because I counted victory. Oh no. Anybody out there know what I'm talking yes, about? Sir. Come on, love land. Does anybody out there know what I'm talking about? All right. All right. Yeah. Praise you. Amen. It says I can't stop now.
God has brought us a mighty long way. And so why should we stop now? Would you please stand so that we can read the mission statement of Loveland Church? For those of you who may have forgotten a few words or so, you can look on your bulletin. Yes, Jackie, you can look on your bulletin. Repeat after me. No. So, let's say it together. Ready? Go. Because Jesus is Lord, the mission of Loveland Church is to worship, evangelize, disciple, serve, fellowship, maximizing lives for trying to live in order to reach the world. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Everybody got an A plus this morning. Well, on behalf of Pastor Chuck, our senior pastor, and Charlotte Singleton, our first lady, and all of the Loveland members, we'd like to greet our special guest today. If you're here for the first time visiting with us, would you please stand that we might greet you with a Loveland amen. You come on and stand now, we won't hurt you. Okay. So is everybody happy then? We got a mission statement. We won't stop now. Everybody loves everybody. This is it, folks. This is it. It's now or never. Okay, so let's stand up and let's greet. How about at least seven people in Jesus' name? Okay? God bless you.
<laughs> but I, I like it when when we get to a point to stop asking and just start Yes. I like it when we just start recognizing who he is. I love it.
imagine the Father in heaven listening to you as you say, All I want, all I want is you. We go through this life looking for things and we miss the fact that all I want, all I want is you. Matthew says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. All I want is you. All I want is you, Lord. All I want is you. All I want. All I want. All I want is you. Every encounter with the Lord, all I can say is all.
surrender all. My God, my God. Do you hear what I say? We're going to have to surrender all. And hopefully I don't embarrass him. But the Lord has offered me this opportunity to be part of this journey. And I've watched this man of God go through the ups and downs. Loveland, you've got a leader here that's anointed. And I'll say to you this morning, my wife and I heard a message this morning 
that Jensen Franklin gave and he talked about the gift that God gives you on a tough journey. My God, my God. It's a gift. And we will possess the land. But sometimes in your life, think about your life. My God, my God. The gift that God gave you as you went through your life, through the ups and downs, and your health not that good, your children are going crazy, and you go through that and you cry out to the Lord. But in the end, you see his mighty works. <laughs> Woo! Somebody know what I'm talking about. It might be one day, it might be 20 years, but God will reveal himself. So I say to you, stay focused. And I say to Loveland, surrender all. Surrender all. Surrender all to the Lord. And the scripture says, seek ye first. Yes, yes. I'm not here to preach this morning, but he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his rights and all these things. We will get the land. Yes, sir. Keep your focus. Keep your head up. Finish the race. My God. Persevere. And I'm saying that to all of Loveland. Persevere. I know it's been tough. I know it's been tough. I've heard the stories. I've heard the disappointments from you. I've heard it. I've heard it. But God said, I've got this. I've got this. Loveland, our God, got this. We will get there. And when we get there, it'll be God's timing. And his timing is perfect. God bless you, Pastor. Wow. <laughs> oh my God.
Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Male chorus. Men, wow. Wow, we. Give the Lord a big hand clap for our men's chorus this morning. Amen. Wow. I knew it was going to be good. I was told and uh, I was warned that it was going to be something special this morning and indeed it has been. Uh, you know, I, I was going to wait till later. I tried to say it while the, while the mic was off. Uh, but uh, early this morning, I didn't know that, that you and Edith were, were praying about this and God was speaking through our brother Jennings and Franklin to you. But what a blessing, because he was talking to me this morning on the same subject, and it involved you. And uh, so, I, just such a shock. You know, you, you never should be surprised when God does something. And, but uh, my goodness, sometimes it's a little bit of a surprise to find out something you shouldn't have been surprised about. <laughs> Praise God. Well, no limit. No limit. Say it again, Deacon Sumter. If God is in it, there's no limit. If God is in it, there's no limit. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Well, you've seen, listen, you might think you saw the same thing this morning. A little bit different twist on the building this morning. We bless God for you, Dave Whedon, who uh, has been putting these videos together for us and uh, bringing forth out of uh, our vision a piece of it for you to see. Now, get this. When we show these videos, it is, uh, it's not a commercial, you know? Our minds can kind of go there. Well, let's try to get us to make sure we give. Well, that is true, but that's secondary, if not tertiary. Our primary purpose uh, is that you might share as the vision unfolds. We want you to be a part of Get this in your spirit. Make it a part of your prayer. Uh, take it with you before the Lord, amen? And uh, as you do, uh, breathe into it by prayer. Breathe into it with a note. Write a note if you see something that you think, make sure you do this or do this or the other. Uh, we've warned you that that's not exactly how it's going to be uh, shaped on the outside. The elevations will include the curves and all of that, but we start it with function. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to aesthetics. So we started with function, then we'll switch to aesthetics. Listen, people say, how in the world are you going to do this? This is going to be one of them apples on the tree too far to reach again. Well, we have a number of reasons why it ought not be so. Let me say again, a number of reasons why it ought not be so. First of all, we started with uh, almost a million dollars. Anybody here? All right. Uh, from, and, you know, and yeah, we want to say from the lawsuit, but it was really more than that because the lawsuit was getting back money that you'd already given. So it didn't start with the lawsuit. Where did it start? With your giving. Yeah, love wins. We gave hundreds of thousands of dollars through love wins, and so the money was in place. We just had to go back and get it when the devil tried to take it. Uh, and uh, so uh, that, that gave us a really good head start. Uh, in total, you and I have given nearly uh, three quarters of a million dollars. $743,000, $743,000 given from Loveland Church and is sitting in the bank, most of it collecting interest. The way, the way, I, the way I worded that might have been, let me say, it's sitting in the bank collecting interest, except for that which we've spent on architects, civil engineers, permits, and attorneys. Uh, getting us to this point. And uh, we must continue to do that. In fact, we were going over 
Friday, um, the uh, cost for architectural and civil engineering work with uh, our staff. And when one of them brought in to me some of the cost, and I was ready to fight. They want to charge all that before you put up two nails and a stick. And uh, so uh, people like Brother Something and others who built things know that uh, a lot of the pre-construction costs might shock many of us, but it does cost to get ready to build. It does cost to get ready to build, and that's what, what we've been doing, getting ready. And uh, we're well vested. We're well vested in it. And uh, too, too far. <laughs> no, how, let's say it like the male chorus. No, no. Can't stop now. Amen. Can't stop now. NBJ. NBJ, Deacons, what's that? Come on, we got that. Deacon Saul led us in that for years. Deacon Saul Miller, our, our chairman emeritus. Let, let's say it again. NBJ? Nobody, Nobody but Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's get our Bibles open now. Let's go to the Word of God. I want you to look at an Old Testament passage of Scripture in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, you might have noted it even when the men were up, that our staff team was flashing this scripture up on the board in 1 Samuel chapter 5. So it shouldn't take you all day to find it. <laughs> Look at somebody, tell them, pay attention. <laughs> but here, here, you will find one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. And uh, it is instructive for us as a church. It has <clears throat> everything to do with the glory of God. Kind of a strange story, but one I pray that you will never forget. I read to you beginning in verse number one of chapter five, first Samuel. <clears throat> then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon. And set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning. There was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon. And both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left on it. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod too this day. But the hand of the Lord 
was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, the ark of God, of the, of the God of Israel, must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us, and Dagon, our God. Father, bless your word. And these minutes that we have in it this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. It's, it's generally around this time of the year that stories are broken out of books resurrected on the screen of the television or movie theaters. The attempts to be frightening, horrific, death-defying. One of those stories that uh, for over a century now has broken out is the headless horseman. And here in that story, Ichabod, Ichabod, Ichabod Crane said to be this headless horseman who rode in the night, his cape flying in the wind on his horse with no head. Of course, that does not frighten as much as it might have 60 years ago. So we've come up with other stuff. Vampires in love. <laughs> who uh, inexplicably bite upon kissing and with an attempt to show the horrific and the terrible and the frightening men have invented things. But nothing really grabs it quite like Ichabod Crane because those who wrote the story had the point, even in the name, Ichabod. Ichabod, we'll come back to that in a minute. But here we are in chapter 5 of 1 Samuel with a frightening story. These folks, the Philistines, who had taken a land and dwelt there, and then God promised that self-same land, you remember, to Abraham. And sent Abraham to take that land. They, the Philistines, having come out of a place called Kaftor, probably the island of Crete, years before Abraham. Then Abraham came in, led by the Spirit of God, and God promised him a land which his descendants and we now call the promised land. But these Philistines were in the land. They had developed a awful method of worship. They had developed blasphemous practices, dishonoring their own bodies, dishonoring women in particular, dishonoring life with sometimes the sacrifice of children, dishonoring God. And so the book records it this way, when the iniquity of the Canaanites, same folks, had waxed full, then God sent his people into that land. See? So they, they, had this, uh, they had these multiple gods. Uh, we think of uh, in theology, I 
had the joy of speaking yesterday at uh, Next Dimensions uh, where Chancellor uh, McLeod, who sits right here today, has founded and leads that school. But I spoke to the student body yesterday and, and pointed out that uh, there are several forms of theology. There is what we know as polytheism, polytheism, poly, which means many, theism from theo, which has to do with God. So polytheism means that it's a religion or nation of what? Many gods, that's polytheism, poly. But we are uh, monotheistic. Uh, and Deuteronomy 6, the Jewish Shema becomes the foundation for that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. There's, there's one. So monotheism is the belief in one God. But here's one that most folks uh, aren't familiar with and don't, don't recognize. It's, it's called henotheism. Henotheism. H-E-N-O-T-H-E-I-S-M. Henotheism. Unlike polytheism, which uh, worships many gods, or monotheism, which worships one, henotheism worships one God without denying the existence of others. It, it says that there are many gods, but I, I focus on or choose this one. And should that sound strange to us, uh, know that it, it exists quite abundantly in our world today, primarily in the Hindu culture, where there are people who acknowledge not 10, not 12, not 20, but who say there are millions of gods. Uh, but they will choose one of the Hindu gods to worship. These Canaanites, Philistines, were henotheistic. They believed in many gods. Uh, and uh, you remember that Elijah and Elijah's main focus, their primary prophetic preaching was against the worship of Baal. Or you'll sometimes hear them saying it in the plural, Baals, because the children of Israel, forgive me if I... If I lecture, I don't want to bore you, but I want just just understand it. That 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 Israel, having come into the promised land, had run into these people who were henotheistic, who worshipped many gods. And so though they knew the Jewish Shema, that here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. They were neighbors and friends and co-workers with people who had this form of worship. And the result was that many of them were compromising. And uh, you remember that, that, that God condemned that, that God told them that's wrong. I, you, 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 you're being unfaithful. He used the word idolatry, which we might not know, is akin to the word adultery. They tie together. So God was saying to them, you're cheating on me. With this worship of many gods. And they did it. And not only did they do it, but uh, you recall that King Solomon, when God blessed him, and King Solomon married many wives, and uh, some of his wives were Baal worshipers. And... Uh, his Baal worshiping wives in the latter years of his life, some of them turned him away from the one God. And God, God told Solomon at the end of his life he was going to deal with him. He said, I'm going to deal with you. He said, because he, listen to what he said. He said, Solomon, I have blessed you. I've taken care and I appeared to you twice. You saw me. You saw me. You know. You know. You know better because you know. And uh, because you know better, 
because you know I'm going to deal with you. You know better than to do what you've been doing. You know better. You know better. Elijah and Elisha railed against this uh, henotheism, uh, the Baal worship. And it's not so foreign to America. In fact, uh, just a few blocks from here is an Ashtaroth temple. Ashtaroth, perhaps I haven't mentioned that the false god here that they worship, Dagon, was related to Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth uh, is the plural for Ashtar or Ishtar, that uh, Ishtar, Ashtar, Dagon was said to be, you see how confusing it gets, Dagon was said to be the father of Baal. So this, this, this God that here in 1 Samuel 5 fell was the father of Baal and the Baal worshipers. He was the father of Baal because of his intercourse with Ishtar, Ashtoreth. The female goddess, the male god got together and produced Baal. Baal and numerous Baals were worshipped. Dagon, this god here in 1 Samuel 5, this god was a god who, if you saw his visage, the, what he looked like, uh, dag, 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 uh, in their Canaanitish language, is the word for fish. And so uh, he had the body of a fish. Are we going too deep this morning, should I say? He had the body of a fish, the head and hands of a man. The body of a fish, the head and hands of a man. And they bowed to worship him. Now, you, you might note that if you read the fourth chapter, here's what you'd see. Are you with me so far? If you read the fourth chapter, here's what you'd see. Israel had gone into battle against the Philistines. But there was a problem. The problem was sin in the camp. And because of the sin in the camp, the Israelites lost that battle. Not only did they lose the battle, but in chapter 4, you'll see they lost about 30,000 warriors. Men had died because of sin. In the course of losing the battle, and as hard and harsh as it might appear to be that they should lose 30,000 soldiers, they also lost the Ark of the Covenant. Whenever they went into battle, and for the benefit of those who may not know, the Ark of the Covenant was a box about the shape of a coffin. Forgive the analogy. But it is a box, and in that box, God chose and assigned them to place the rod that budded, Aaron's rod, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, one of the candelabra from the old temple. And, uh, and then God said, my presence, that, that is that God would anoint that box. So that ark was anointed. It, it's the whole reason and the whole point of uh, Indiana Jones and the search for the lost ark because the power assigned to that ark uh, gave them great strength in battle. When they went into battle, they would win and defeat their enemies because of the presence of the ark. But the presence of the ark was really not the point. It was not the presence of the box. It was what was in the box. It was the anointing of God, the presence of God, that uh, God's presence was in the box. I, I hope I'm not confusing you too much, but I hope you'll stay with me and, and see this whole point. And they went into battle with the Ark of the Covenant as in times past they had won. They expected to win in that battle. The only problem was, though they had the presence of God in the box, there was sin outside the box. And so while they had the power of God, they did not have the weapon of God. God did not fight for them and they lost the battle. In the course of losing the battle, they lost the men. In the course of losing the battle and the men, they lost the Ark of the Covenant. So now the Philistines have the Ark of the Covenant. 
And they march dutifully, victoriously off the battlefield. And they carry the Ark of the Covenant and set it down by their fish with the man head and the man head. And they left it overnight. Here's what you ought to know about God. Here's what you ought to know about him. He can win and lose at the same time. He can lose and then win out of his loss. God is a God who can fire you and leave you on the job. He's a God can, that can work miracles out of nothing. He can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. He's a God who can take a brown cow, let him eat green grass and produce white milk. He's a God that can make the sun stand still without losing any time. He's a God that can embarrass his people without embarrassing himself. He's a God that can stand high and look across and see that which cannot be seen. It was the great theologian Paul Tillich who described him this way. He said a mystery, that's what God is and over and over again. We see him as a mystery. Tillich put it this way, that a mystery is that which even when revealed remains a mystery. And that's a mysterious statement, but if you watch it close enough, you get the idea of what he's saying. Let me say it again. A mystery is that which even when revealed remains a mystery. I understand that God is great. I understand that God is good. I love him, have him personally in my heart. I know him as my savior and my king. And yet when I think about his greatness and his bigness, when I think about how he spoke everything out of nothing, when I speak about somebody who could stand on nothing, reach back in nowhere, grab the hand full of nothing, throw it nowhere and make everything there is, I, I'm frightened by that. He's awesome. He's terrifying. He is so big that he horrifies me and yet I know he loves me now that's a mystery that's a mystery that's a mystery that's 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 a mystery how can you take a God so big and so great and yet somehow have him in your heart how could he love me even though I know that I've sinned how could he stand for me die for me even though I don't deserve it now that's a mystery but I do have the revelation I do have the revelation and so this, this, this great mysterious God whose presence is signified by the box is set next to Dagon. In fact, somewhat before Dagon, when you see house of Dagon, it could easily be translated temple of Dagon. So they bring the power of God in the temple of Dagon, set it down next to Dagon. When they set it down next to Dagon, flip off the lights, lock the doors, go home. <laughs> and they come back the next morning. Something strange has happened. Something, something odd has taken place. They come back the next morning and they find the ark sitting right there where it's always been sitting. But Dagon has fallen. His fish body has fallen before The Ark of the Covenant. Well, somebody said, well, yeah, I didn't know. We must have set it up there kind of crooked. Maybe, maybe we didn't get it all the way up there on the thing like it ought to have been. So, uh, that, you know, maybe the earth shook a little bit. You know, it's not doesn't have four edges like that ark has four edges. And, you know, it fell. So they picked it up. And they put it back. And they came back the next morning after locking the doors, turning off the light and going home. They come back the next morning, and this time, as if to make his point. Not only did Dagon fall, but the head is broken off. He can't think. The hands are broken off. He can't do a thing. It's a shame to start with, but, but watch what takes place. Dagon now is prostrate. He's prostrate before the Ark of the Covenant. Let's look at this, let's look at this first point in, 
in these few minutes that we have remaining, the presence of the glory of God. Somebody say it out loud with me. The presence of the glory of God. Look at verse number three. Look at verse number three. Here's what it says. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on its face. I like the way the scripture put it, its face, not his face. Its face, its face, because it's simply a statue. Its face, to them a God, to them a person. But its face, acknowledging that it's simply a carving of stone. Its face, not his face. The reason, a hundred probably, of reasons why God refuses for us to make idols, not even pictures, to try to depict him. If I had a picture uh, of God, and uh, whether that picture be some beautiful brunette photo of Jesus, and we set it here at the top of the church, I'm not, not knocking anybody that does it, but, but folks would tend to bow down to the picture. Here's the problem with bowing down to a picture, a statue, a carving. Somebody had to hang it up there. Well, you don't get the point. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that, you might say, preacher? What's wrong with somebody? It's a sorry God that needs his subject to hang him up. It's a sorry God that needs his subject to take chisel and hammer and carve him out. Isaiah chapter 45, 46, 47. When, when God makes a declaration about himself and he tells Israel, I want you to know something. I am God. There's nobody else but me. There is no other God. I'm the only God. I shake the heavens. I form the earth. And when Job, who had, if anybody, and when Job had, if anybody, when Job had, if anyone, when Job had reason to question him, that self-same God spoke out of the heavens and said to Job, Job, where were you when I shaped the heavens? Where were you when I shaped the Capricorns and the Orions? Where were you when I put the stars in the sky? Where were you when I made the morning stars sing together? How can you that I made tell me who did the making how to handle what I made? I've given you the ability to think and the reason, but that doesn't mean that you can question the one that made you out of nothing. So it's a sorry God that's got to have his subject. Our God is a God who's in everything, but depends on nothing. Got you, but don't have to have you. <laughs> Loves you, but does not need you. Understand something about God. He's God by himself and don't need nothing else. Here's his point. Even in the midst of this awful calamity of a battle that has been lost, in the midst of defeat, he shows himself strong. So the, the presence the present. What, what is the point? The point is this. There is absolutely nothing. No one. I said this to some people uh, yesterday and some others on Friday. Uh, th th some awful report from uh, back east uh, of a preacher who just, I, the things that he did. I, I just, you know, it's not one thing. It was, it was it's just so shameful. It make every preacher ashamed. Uh, what he did. I'm not just talking about slipping. You know, that's one thing. You know, it's one thing to slip and fall in the sin. Uh, th th there's a song that says, I was sinking deep in sin. <laughs> but for some people, it's I was sinking deep in sin. Whee! 
And this guy, what he did, it, I, I can't even repeat it. Um, but but uh, first, uh, multiple adulteries. Uh, in the midst of the multiple adulteries, contracted HIV. Five years after contracting HIV, he's continued in his adulteries. Uh, after five years, goes to full-blown AIDS. In the meantime, stealing church money. Uh, AIDS transmitted to members of his church. Stealing the money while he's spreading the AIDS. And at the same time, using drugs. Now, you know, at, at a point, you, you want to be merciful, and, and God tells us to be. But you just go, man, you know, if I had, I'd take a chance on catching AIDS to beat your... Um, I would just whoop you bloody. I mean, at a point, at a point. Sin is one thing. But just going that far, you just, but here's what I said to the folks Friday and yesterday. God can expose that preacher's sin and just keep right on going. People get embarrassed. They say, well, I don't know. Ain't nobody going to church now. This is the problem. They're hypocrites. That's the problem with the hypocrites. But let me tell you something, folks. Uh, people that talk about hypocrites, they wasn't coming no way. <laughs> and, uh, and, and God can use the stuff I just enumerated about that preacher back east. He'll use that to save some soul. You don't hear what I'm saying.